uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and um, I'm here to learn really and to talk to a friend of mine, uh, Ken Shelton, about uh, race and privilege and equity and school and um, kind of cross pollinate ideas. And as you can see, okay, I am a, uh, a 60 plus white male. And Ken is not, I'll let Ken introduce himself. And uh, we both felt that dialogues like this are really important. And so we're gonna do a series of talks. Uh, at some point we may invite other people to join us for these talks, where we're starting off with four talks. So Ken, why don't you also introduce yourself? Yeah, so thank you, Mitch. Um, I think it's important for everyone to know that you and I have been friends for, a while. <laughs> right. Um, I want to say we first crossed paths, obviously through social media, like realistically, probably a little bit more than 10 years ago, maybe. Right. I was thinking uh, number 12 popped into my mind, but somewhere 10, 12. Yeah. 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 No. And um, as, as everyone can see, I'm, I'm a, a middle-aged African-American male. Um, but I, I, I wanted to emphasize that because you know, in the context of our conversation, you know, I, I always encourage folks to look at what are the things that bring you together that help make each other, uh, that help make your, your circle of friends or group of friends that much more diverse, dynamic, and, um, and inspiring. Mm -hmm. And so, yep. you know, I mean, again, you look at what brought us together and, and that, that we've known each other for, for, for at least a decade. So, uh, it's a privilege to be on here, and I look forward to our conversation, and hopefully some of the things that you and I discuss will be a catalyst for additional thought as well as hopefully action in anyone who happens to be watching. I hope so. So one of the things, and it's funny because we, we started talking about this before we actually started recording, is that what's, what's current is Ahmaud Arbery and his murder. Um, right. and different reactions to, to, to that. And, um, you know, initially I was really, I, you know, well, I, first of all, I was really upset, but, um, I was, I was confused because I wasn't sure, uh, I wasn't sure what to do, you know, other than to say this is wrong or to think that this is wrong. Um, what I, I couldn't figure out like a, a call to action. And yeah. I was, I, you know, I was bringing that up with Ken. And so I'm going to hand it over to Ken and, um, and you had, you had some thoughts. Right. I mean, I have, I have a lot of thoughts <laughs> right. around, around this, around, um, you know, and I'm drawing a blank on her name, Brianna Thomas, uh, who, was uh, murdered last week in Louisville, Kentucky, where the police oh, yes. uh, went to the wrong house, walked in, and just, you know, immediately started firing. Right. Her, her boyfriend and, was there. Her boyfriend was licensed to have a gun. Uh, somebody breaks into the house, doesn't it say that they're police or anything. Um, the right. first reaction of somebody who has a gun when somebody's breaking into their house is to get out the gun. And... 20 rounds of fire were fired by the police, killing her. Not him, as it turns out, but killing her. Right. And then you find out that the person they were actually looking for, they were at the wrong house. And, and they already had the rest of her. Right. And they already had. Right. So, you know, I mean, I think, look, there's a lot of things to discuss around this. And obviously for you and I, our, our primary lens is through education. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things. One, which I eventually we'll publish some thoughts that I have written uh, around this is the fact that, you know, this is not nor new for many of us. This is, this is a constant occurrence. And, you know, I think that once that footage got put out to where everyone could see it, it was shocking for some people, but it wasn't for, uh, put it this way, it wasn't for my close circle of, of friends that are Latinx or African American. It was, oh, here we go again. Right. And I, I think that, you know, for your viewers and listeners, there's, there's several things to be 
cognizant of with this. One, uh, which I pointed this out to a number of my close friends, is there is a long history of voyeurism when it comes to black death. Um, and one of them I've told people to look up is do a Google search for Jackson County, Florida, Claude Neal. And, uh, and then look out the archives of the images where it was a planned lynching of a young black male that was going to be in uh, the town square where you have all the families around with their picnic blankets and everything else and they were gonna uh, essentially execute him or murder him rather there um, on full display. Uh, and then there's lots of other archive footage where you can see the gathering of a community of people, fathers, mothers, children, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, all of that, uh, where the, 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 the black death is on display. And again, that's why I said there's a long history of voyeurism when it comes to black death. And that's why I discourage the, actually the, the continued spreading of that video because it's, it's one, it's trauma inducing. And two, you know, for every one video you see like that, how come I don't see a video of, let's say, a black male? Uh, and in fact, I did post, repost this on Twitter where there were these two um, young men, two black men in Miami that were, I, I don't know how they got it, but ultimately in their car, they were driving around Miami and making sure that all the homeless folks had food. Okay, you notice that wasn't spread around. Hmm. So, so there's one aspect of that that's along those lines. And, and the question I always ask, and I would ask is if you, if you watched it over and over and over again, one, why? And two, what were you thinking and feeling? Because if you were thinking in a way that makes you feel bad and that is tragic, just know that that's not unusual, okay? The other thing is, you know, last week a lot of people ran. They did their 2.23 miles because, um, you know, he was um, killed on February 23rd, which two months before anything was ever even done. Uh, and then last, last week, it was supposed to be his birthday, which I forgot the date, last week, last Friday. But, you know, people posted, I'm, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. I ran, I, I paused at each half mile, just uh, to capture some thoughts of what I was gonna do in writing. But ultimately, and this ties in with some of what you and I were discussing prior to recording is, my thing is, okay, so you did your run, now what? And, you know, there's a degree of what I call pacification uh, around, okay, I ran, I feel good about myself. And it's like, no, that's not the purpose of doing that. And, and the, uh, the, the phrase that I, I will use, especially in my writing, is it's the hedonic treadmill where, you know, you're moving, but you're not really going anywhere. And that's, that's what I look at that run as is uh, a thing of, okay, so I ran, which means I feel better about myself and I feel like it's important and I feel a degree of solidarity. But even in the video I recorded on Instagram, solidarity means nothing without tangible action. And I love solidarity. We should all be, we should all have a degree of solidarity on, on human rights and what's right. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't include tangible actions, then you're better off just not running. Like, like it's, it's, it's a, it's a waste. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, kind of uh, tying in with what we were discussing prior to recording is the idea around what do you do? And, you know, for your listeners, I think there's, there's a number of things that, that you can do. Um, to me, one, the default should be uh, first looking at what books are available for you to broaden your perspective and broaden your understanding of the society than societal structures that we live in. Uh, there's a lot. I'm seeing a lot more people gravitate towards uh, Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility, which is great. Um, but keep in mind, she's a white female who wrote that. And in and, and the interviews I've heard from her, she acknowledges that. And that's one where I always question and, and caution, uh, in this case, school leaders, that they look for a workshop facilitator or professional developer who looks like them to do right. that work. Right. Uh, and it's problematic. Um, I rarely have heard a, a white individual acknowledge their entitlement, their privilege, and their perspective prior to doing any of that degree of work. Um, and it really goes into the whole argument around empathy and compassion, which, you know, for me, I don't, look, I always say this, people always say, well, you know, you, sometimes you got to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And I said, that's not good enough because at the end of that mile, you can take my shoes off. I can't. And, and so, you know, there's that aspect as well. So for me, it's like, 
if you're looking at books, then, you know, Robin DiAngelo is one, but then there's a whole list of other books. Uh, Ijoma Aluo has a book called, So You Want to Talk About Race? Make, uh, she's a, a multiracial female. My buddy, who's one of my favorites, is Dr. Kendi, Dr. Ibram Kendi. He has a book called How to Be an Anti How to Be Anti Racist, which is great. And then he also did a this one who wrote like le Letters to My Son or a Letter to My Son. Say it again, please. Letter to My Son or Letters to My Son. Oh no, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, Tom that? Heisey Coat. Right uh, between right. the world. Yes. Yes, between the world and me. That's another one. Uh, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm a That's big fan of coats as well. Um, and so for your your audience, yeah, it's basically the book Between the World and Me. It's a book that he wrote, uh, essentially writing a letter to um, to his son, to his unborn son. Um, uh, just kind of giving him the talk, which, you know, it's interesting because when I bring that up in some of my talks, I mention the fact that I know for me, my first experience with the talk was, as far as I can remember, uh, with my dad was if I was nine years old. So, uh, and then of course it occurred consistently for the remainder of my father's life all the way up until I would say even literally days before his passing. Mm -hmm. But, but ultimately it's not just the reading of the books. It's, you know, are you, you know, are you supporting organizations that support, you know, human rights, black rights, black lives matter. I mean, it's, and, and, and that's one, but there's a bunch. Uh, are you, uh, amplifying the voices of of those that are telling their own stories, are sharing their own stories. Um, are you holding your own yourself and your own immediate family accountable? Are you holding your friends accountable? I mean, like all of those little things that they don't have to be what I call the social media moment. They have to be the little things that you do that either one provide an additional perspective and learning opportunity for you know a family member or a circle of friends. Or two, you hold them accountable. You know, I mean, I've seen right. it. So, where, in fact, I got messages from friends who who said, you know, this person said this, and I'm not sure how to respond. And I said, well, look, I can help you navigate that, but ultimately, you have to walk that path, and you cannot rely on me as your sole right. uh, resource because you have to develop a body of experience and knowledge yourself to be able to respond to it without relying on someone like me to do it. So, I, in terms of holding ourselves accountable, there's there's an interesting double thought that I had. Uh, the first part of the thought um, is that a typical American or maybe typical white American um, response, when you hear about a Muslim killing people is why aren't the other Muslims um, expressing outrage about this? Why are they, why aren't they saying this is not the Islam religion, the Islam, you know, what, this is, this person is wrong. This person should be condemned. So typical response is to say, geez, the Muslims should be policing this themselves and they're not. And then the typical white response to something like the murder of the, of the, now I forget, with the woman in St. Louis or Ahmad Arbery, the murder of Ahmad Arbery um, mm -hmm. is, isn't that a shame that this happened this time? Or isn't that a shame that this happened? Instead of saying, well, wait a minute, you know, what is it that we as whites are doing and we should be policing ourselves? We should not be allowing whites to walk in and kill people who are of color. And yeah. we have to call ourselves accountable the same way we're asking Muslims to call themselves accountable. Um, we need to shine the light on ourselves. I, I agree. I think the, the, the main issue I have with, well, why don't you police your own kind of thing, is that assumes that we're all a monolith, which we are not. Which we're not, and, right. Um, and, 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 you know, and then there's the, the added layer of the best way to, the best way to in, in embody a degree of accountability starts within. And, you know, again, it's, it's, there's going to be extremists, outliers, or, 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 you know, anything along those lines in any group, in any group, uh, whatever your cultural identity is. I mean, you can do it on religion, you can do it on language, you could do it on race, you could do it on ability, you could do it on, uh, um, uh, whatchamacallit, on um, uh, gender identity. I mean, any one of those things, you're going to have the extreme. But I think in terms of all of this, it really, it really it really hits 
hard as far as the fact that how there's so little that we are exposed to to get a deeper understanding of each other unless we make a concerted effort to do that. And, and I'll even, you know, again, because when we started recording, I'll even talk about education. You know, I, I mean, I mean to, to put you on a spot, but not really put you on a spot. If you think about it, how many conferences have you been, have you been to where you've seen a speaker that looks like me as, as one of the, the marquee speakers? It's, um, it's, uncan it's, it's, uh, well, I've, so most don't, period. Almost all don't. I will say right. that I participate in the um, EdTech Industry Network, which is a division of the SIA, and that's been a huge impetus to integrate our speakers and have people, Latinx speakers, Black speakers, um, Asian speakers, um, yeah. and not have um, people who look like me be 80% of the speakers. Right, right. And I mean, and that's a, that's a big, that's a, that's a start. Um, because I can tell you from my experience, having, you know, had the opportunity to be on quite a few stages uh, and continue to strive to be on stages. And you I mean, happen to be a phenomenal speaker. Oh, I period. appreciate that. I mean, you happen to be a phenomenal speaker. So, um, so in one sense, it doesn't matter who, you, you know, what your racial makeup is or who, you know, what race you are, what gender you are. When you get up on stage, you're electrifying. And that's period. But knowing that, you should be you should be busy two hundred days a year. Yeah, because we have to make up for it. <laughs> I, I, I know. I mean, you know. I mean, I, I will say that I get I get a large degree of support from friends like you, uh, for sure. Um, and you know, I guess for me, it's 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 it's, it's several things. One, um, you know, I have been afforded the opportunity to be on a lot of stages, and there's a lot more stages I would like to be on. There's stages I like to return to. Mm -hmm. uh, but I shouldn't be the only voice. Right. And, and further to that point, the feedback that I've gotten, the unfiltered raw feedback at many, many, many conferences, and, and I don't need to specify uh, which ones because it's been so many, uh, are things like, I've never seen a black male speaker before at a conference or, wow, seeing you speak changes my perspective on, on the students that I teach. And I mean, all these little things that where, you know, I would say that maybe an initial reaction would be a degree of shock and, and, um, and like, wow, really? But I understand it. And so for me, it's like it further emphasizes the need for us to be able to uh, have experiences with each other, to be able to have conversations, to be able to do things that there's a degree of commonality, in this case, education, or even specifically educational technology. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the narratives that you're exposed to are not only broadened by who's telling the stories, but the types of stories that they're telling. Right. And one of the things I really, really would love to see, especially given all the recent current uh, recent occurrence of events where we currently are and where I hope we will be is, uh, and I know this is a hard one, but it is something that I would challenge any educator on is to really start to push back on the, what I call the platitudes and toxic positivity. If you look at a lot of speakers, there's a lot of buzzwords and a lot of generalities and a lot of, of, of what I call uh, narratives from privilege where it's like, okay, that may sound good, but it's not realistic, nor is it reality. And that's when you get into the whole idea around platitudes. And I mean, I just, I've just watched, I've seen some speakers and right. they say stuff and I'm like, where is that coming from? And, if, and then you look around and people are just eating it up and it's like, okay, I wanna know what you're hearing. How's that gonna change any problems of practice you have when you go back to your respective school district, school site or classroom? Right. It's and, just reinforcing and, and again, things that you wanted to believe anyhow. Correct. Uh, which is a confirmation bias, by the way. Right. Uh, and then, of course, when you get into the toxic positivity aspect, you know, my whole thing is a it's a quote that I'm going to include in my write up is if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. And so if right. you're constantly being inundated with, oh, things are great you know, uh, unicorns and rainbows and all this, you're not going to grow, you're not going to change. And then when you start looking at things like the uh, enduring factors of who has access to um, access and opportunity when it comes to schools, which is how I define equity. And then you look at it and you say, well, gee, those aren't changing. Yeah. 
Let's go back to those PD experiences that you had where it was nothing but platitudes and toxic positivity. So, you know, I think it all ties in with what we're sharing around what's yep. going on is that, you know, eventually you either, you, you, you know, life is dynamic. You either progress or regress. And if you're not progressing, then you're regressing. Right. So what I'm thinking is that we've pretty much come to the end of our first 15 minutes. So I think as a, as, as kind of a recap, one thing is that you mentioned probably three or four authors that yeah. uh, we all should be reading. Can you just reiterate, say, four authors who you think we should be reading? So in terms of what we're challenged with right now and the idea that I need to do better and I want to learn more, um, I would recommend for sure, as far as books go, the following, in the following order. I would read Ijoma Luo, so you want to talk about race. Then I would read White Fragility by Dr. Robin D'Angelo. Then I would read How to Be Anti-Racist by Dr. Ibram Kendi, Ibram X. Kendi, in okay. that order. Okay. Um, and then once you've done that, then perhaps I would get into, you know, Between the World and Me by ta Coates. I also think for educators, which I wish we'd have had more time to discuss this thing, but for educators, I think reading Dr. Chris Emden uh, for White Folks Who Teach in the Hood, uh, which is great. And, um, and then honestly, it's an older book, but Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that should be required reading as well. And quite frankly, I mean, I'm throwing more books out. Uh, Dr. Beverly Tater, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Okay. So those first three, mm -hmm. and then those next three. So at the end of this, uh, at this segment, I'm going to put up a graphic that will have the names of those books so, so that people okay. can see them. Um, and before we end this segment, uh, what do you think we should talk about next? What should our how next segment? Why, yeah, how and why educators should be doing better and operating through a lens of equity. Okay, so, so if you stay tuned for our next segment it's going to be how and why educators should be doing better and we're going to attack that through a lens of equity so um thank you ken for thank you. uh thank for you. help you know uh for this uh, conversation and uh we'll be we'll be back soon